probably one of the worst men that ever walked the face of the earth to this point is Adolf Hitler. Today's broadcast, we're going to see that there are two men who appear during the tribulation period that make Adolf Hitler look like a choir boy. God, thank you for the broadcast today. I pray for wisdom, insight into your word, and open here ears to all the listeners. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. A number of years back, Denzel Washington made a uh, very remarkable movie. It had to do with the tribulation period, and I would rather suspect that he took the, the part because his dad was a preacher, and no doubt he knew that uh, the things that he was portraying had a certain truth to him. In any event, he pictured a man that was living uh, during the tribulation period in America. And uh, all the infrastructure had been taken down. Uh, law and order was non-existent. And it was a little bit like the old Wild West again. And he con kind of wandered uh, to and fro throughout this uh, chaos. And uh, the subject matter was quite simple. What in the world is going on in the world? And uh, the general consensus was that there was only one book that could reveal that truth. It was called the Book of Eli. And he was on a, a lifelong search for this wonderful, illuminating Book of Eli. And finally, after a number of years and great hardship, he found his way out to San Francisco. And uh, lo and behold, out to uh, Alcatraz, that little island in the uh, the bay there, San Francisco Bay, where the criminals were kept. And there they were printing the Book of Eli, the only place in America that was printing the Book of Eli. And what was the Book of Eli? Well, sir, it was the book of actually Eli is a synonym for Elijah. Elijah was the man who preached during the tribulation period. Surely he would have the answer to what the situation is in the world and what's, what in the world's going on. And what was it that this man, Elijah, preached but nothing else but the word of God? And the little island of Alcatraz printed the book of Eli, which in fact was the Bible. It was called the Alcatraz edition. <laughs> so, now I say all that because what we're going to look at tonight in this 13th chapter fits in quite nicely with that story. What in the world is going on during this tribulation period? What is bringing all this chaos, all this mayhem, all this destruction to the world? God is going to pull back the veil. He's going to remove the curtain. We're going to see behind the scenes to know exactly what is happening. Well, let's pick up in verse 1 of chapter 13. Then I stood... On the sand of the sea, John says, he's about to see a vision. This is a frightening vision. And brother, he's seen some, some <laughs> bad ones already. But this one, I think it's even worse. Then I stood on the sand of the sea and saw a beast rising from the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And on his horns, ten crowns. And on his heads, a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him power, his throne, and great authority. Let me stop right there. Now John is standing on the seashore. Maybe he's off hours from mining in Patmos. He's standing on the seashore, the Mediterranean, and he sees as he gazes up over the ocean this ugly monster rising out of the sea. And it's, it's a beast with, with seven heads. Can you imagine? Seven, completeness. And it's got ten horns. Ten horns and one of the heads. And the horns have got crowns on them. What in the world is this man seeing? Friends, we need the book of Daniel to interpret this vision. God's going to give us an explanation of it in a little further detail in the next chapter. But what he's looking at is world empires, not some of them, all of them when Daniel was down yonder 
in Iraq, land of Babylon. He got a vision, and he got a vision of a statue, and it showed all the world empires from Daniel's time right on down to this time. And by the way, Daniel's statue had 10 toes on it. Notice that one of the heads has 10 crowns on it, 10 horns with 10 crowns, same group of nations a coalition of ten nations. What this man is seeing, this beast rising from the ocean that is empowered and given authority by Satan himself, the red dragon, is nothing less than the seven world empires that have ruled this planet Earth for 6,000 years. Starting back yonder with Egypt, remember Moses went on down and confronted Pharaoh, and next was the Assyrian Empire, number two, then the Babylonian Empire that Daniel confronted. And then we find the Mede-Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, and then the Roman Empire. And friends, that's six. There's just one more to go. And mark it well. There'll only be seven world human empires in totality. Only seven, no more. The last one, the one that existed in John's time, was in fact the Roman Empire and it literally disintegrated. It fell apart at the seams in Europe and Europeans and dictators were trying to put that empire back together again for the last 2,000 years. They even had a little nursery rhyme that, uh, that spoke of it. Humpty Dumpty sat in the wall. Humpty Dumpty took a great fall. All the king's men, all the king's horsemen couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Europe has been trying for thousands of years, 1,500 years, attempting to put the European Empire, the old Roman Empire, back together again. They will succeed. Hitler tried it. He called it the Third Reich. He failed. Charlemagne tried it. He failed. Napoleon tried it. He failed. But there will become one who is referred to as the Beast. He's going to come out of Europe a coalition of exactly 10 nations that will ultimately rule the world. That'll be the seventh empire and the last one, human empire, because of course the Lord Jesus is going to come back and the eighth will be his peaceful kingdom, thousand year reign. What John is seeing and the message we need to get across is as clear as I know how. These world empires, not just a bunch of men with a lot of ideas about how to run a society. They are empowered and they get their direction and their authority from Satan himself. Apostle Paul said that Satan was in fact the God of this age. When Moses went down and confronted Pharaoh, he was confronting more than just a human being, a man. There was a, a, a evil a, a, a disgusting, what words can I use? Despicable being who was behind Pharaoh, who was empowering him. It was Satan himself. The Bible says of Satan and anybody else that fits under this category, all those that hate me, God says, love death. Pharaoh loved death persecuted God's people 400 years, made slaves out of them, and threw their babies into the Nile. You could write on down every one of these world empires has been despicably wicked. In John's day, bloody Nero sat in the throne as he saw this vision. Brother, was he a despicable man. Murdered his own mother, murdered his two wives, murdered millions of Christians in the Colosseums of Rome but he's just a man. It was that evil, despicable person behind him that gave him his authority and energized him, Satan himself. Apostle Paul says, we don't war against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in heavenly places. Our enemy is not men. God created them. He loves every last one of them, but friends, when they're not born again, Satan is their father. <laughs> and he is motivating them and directing their thinking the way that he wants them to be directed. He is a hateful, evil being. God's people are typified by love because the Lord Jesus is love. 
And the Bible says that all those born into his family are being conformed to Jesus' image, which is what? God is love. All those not born into God's family, the longer they live in the devil's family, are being more conformed to his image, which is what? The opposite of love is hatred. And any time you find a lot of hatred around, you're going to find the devil is behind it. And so John sees seven world empires. And he also sees a coming empire that has not yet come into existence in our lifetime, but will. And then he says this. And by the way, notice how he describes this empire. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth was like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power. It is a fierce empire. It is a fierce beast. And by the way, every world empire, everyone without exception, has persecuted the Jew and persecuted God's people. It is a Satan's instrument to pound God's people, to persecute them. The devil uses false religion to deceive. But the, but the devil uses false the devil, let me rephrase that. The devil uses governments, world governments, to persecute God's people. Listen to this now. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of the heads as it had been mortally wounded, and the deadly wound was healed. The ten nations are a resurrection of the old Roman Empire. That's the thought there. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? And who is able to make war with him? Remarkable questions indeed. If you turn with me over to 2 Thessalonians, I think we're going to see something quite interesting because the Apostle Paul talked about this very event. And I think it's very significant, his words. So uh, you don't have to turn there, just a few verses. I'm in 2 Thessalonians, and I'm going to pick up right in chapter 2. Now, just to get the context, get things straight, <clears throat> Apostle Paul, when he formed this church, as he formed every church that he preached to, told them that Jesus was coming back. That was a paramount teaching with Paul. They were persecuted. Rome, hard on the heels of God's people. And Paul wanted them to have a hope in their heart that this was not going to last forever, that Jesus was going to come back and deliver them. And somebody had written a letter to the Thessalonican church and said, Oh, I got some bad news for you. You guys missed the rapture. And the problems you're having now is the beginning of the tribulation period, supposedly written in Paul's handwriting. Paul wrote 2 Thessalonians to correct these people. I didn't write the letter, the first thing. That was fake news. I didn't write the letter. Listen, Jesus is coming back first. And listen to, listen to what he says. I think he's very clear. I'm picking up in verse... Uh, well, let me read, read the whole thing. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the, the word is apostasy, now just right in there, rapture comes first, unless the taking away comes first. That's what it actually says in the Greek word. Greek language. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. In other words, what Paul is saying, listen boys, how could, how could it possibly be the tribulation period? Look, the temple's still standing in Jerusalem. This is written about maybe 60 AD, 55 AD. 15 years before the destruction of the temple. And Paul's saying, look, do you see somebody sitting in the temple saying that he's God? And the Thessalonians say, well, no. Then how could then we be in the tribulation period? 
That's his thinking, and that's his reasoning. Listen to him as he continues, because now we get into an understanding of how a man so wicked and despicable, who is worse than Adolf Hitler, that John calls a beast, could even be walking around on the earth exercising the authority and control of the world that he's exercising. This explains it. Listen to this now. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. Something's restraining this beast, this antichrist, this one who's going to sit in the temple. There's a restrainer, gentlemen, Paul's saying. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then that lawless one will be revealed, the restrainer, and the only restrainer against evil in this despicable evil world is God's Spirit. And he lives exclusively in God's people. And when the rapture happens and we're caught up to heaven, there'll be no longer any restraints upon evil. And this is what Paul is trying to get across. When we leave, all hell breaks loose. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, and he's going to do so until the restrainer is taken out of the way, and then he's going to have free course. We've already got a wicked world. Satan's already manipulating and controlling things, bringing governments down and raising up wicked ones. We see all these things transpire before our very eyes. A number of years ago, and I mentioned this story one of the time before, but it fits in perfectly right here and makes my point. And by the way, the Bible says in the chapter we're looking at, the 13th chapter, chapter of Revelation, that this lawless one is going to control every nation, every tribe, every tongue. This is a worldwide empire. And America is under his control. How could these things be so? Because, because the mystery of lawlessness is already working. It's like leaven. The wickedness in America is dragging the country down. Alexander Solzhenitsyn was a very respected author, Russian citizen came out against the Soviet Union in his books, wound up in the gulag for a number of years, the prisoner camp way up north in Siberia, finally released, and he came and he was invited to speak at Harvard University. He didn't understand, though, the dynamics of Harvard University, and he got up and he said, you know what? I remember my grandparents saying, the reason that we have communism and these horrible things that have come upon us it's because we have forgotten all about God. Those words no sooner came out of his mouth, and they started laughing and mocking him, not only the students, some of the professors. What Alexander Solzhenitsyn did not realize was that 30% of the professors in Harvard University were avowed Marxists, <laughs> and the rest of them were sympathetic towards him, avowed Marxists. And here he was saying that communism was bad. And here he was saying, the West is going to fall too. The same way that Russia fell, the West is going to fall too. Because I see this insidious doctrine beginning to permeate American society. It's no longer a Christian country. It never really was, but it had a huge Christian influence, which is waning rapidly. 1970s, they outlawed prayer in schools. In the 30s, and by the way, it was ACLU that brought that lawsuit. In the 30s, they outlawed the teaching of creation in schools and introduced evolution. They took away creation because that's a religion. We can't have a state religion. They took away Christianity and put their own religion in there, secular humanism, whose foundation is Darwinism took away the God-given religion and put the devil's religion in there. We wonder why we have so many problems in the school. 
We got a 30, 40 percent graduation folks that can't even speak English clearly or read it. They're Ill functionally illiterate, believe it or not. Shocking. How can these things be so? Because when you kick God out of something, it leaves a huge vacuum for the devil. It was ACLU that did that also. Prayer, introduction of Darwinism to schools, also, also abortion brought into the public arena by the ACLU. It has been taken off of their website a few years ago. Not my words. The goal of the ACLU is communism, their own words. They took it off the website because it doesn't sound too kosher anymore. But that's what they had up there for a number of years, and they were being honest about it. We're in dire straits. The world is in dire straits. Atheism, godless atheism, is permeating the world. So you can see it would be very easy to understand how this beast could arise. He's being set up. The mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Listen to what he says. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way, and then that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. That lawless one. Apostle Paul, when he wants to describe the Antichrist, calls him the lawless one. He keeps no laws. Why? Well, he doesn't believe in the Bible, and he teaches the world. You don't have to worry about the Bible, that old antiquated book with those rules and regulations that take all your fun away out of life. No. There is no God, therefore there is no law. We make the rules, and listen, you got some good news for you. You don't have to worry about immorality. That's not against my rules. You go right ahead and be immoral as you want to, because I am too. Huh. He's the lawless one. He doesn't keep any of God's laws. This is the most wicked, despicable person. Brings about the death of millions upon millions of human beings. Not a pleasant subject to have to discuss, but here it is before our eyes. 13th chapter of Revelation. Go on back there with me. Listen to this now. <clears throat> Verse 5. And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was giving authority to continue for 42 months, three and a half years. It's going to be a mighty rough three and a half years, I can assure you that. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. Now, this is quite interesting. And it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. This man is the ultimate blasphemer. This reminds me a little bit like what Nikita Khrushchev said about God, supposedly an avowed atheist. He said, God knows I don't believe in him. That was his very words. God knows I don't believe in him. Well, this man apparently is an avowed atheist that does also believe in God. Because how can you blaspheme somebody that doesn't exist? He's blaspheming God's name, his tabernacle, the people who dwell in heaven. That'll be us. And also, notice something else. He is given authority and power over the saints. Who in the world is that? Well, somebody can say, well, isn't that talking about the church? Uh, it, yeah, maybe that's the church, and here's the church right in the tribulation period. No. Let's read the verse again. And it was granted to him to make war with the saints. That means sanctified ones. May I suggest to you, tribulation believers, not the church. It doesn't say he was given authority to persecute the church. You haven't seen the word church since the third chapter of Revelation because the, th the church was caught up into God's presence is in fact the 24 elders that Paul talks about all the way through the book of Revelation. And may I suggest something else to you? These group of believers, the devil has got power to overcome them. Notice the verse, overcome them. Yet the Lord Jesus said, I'm going to build my church and the gates of Hades won't overcome it. This ain't the church, folks. The devil can't overcome the church, can persecute it, 
these believers are overcome by Satan, not the church, tribulation, saints, and believers. And authority was given to him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. You. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity, and he who kills with a sword must be killed with a sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. The book of Eli, if you're a believer, you really do have a choice. You can speak out for God, you may go into captivity. You may be one of the Jews that are taken out of the land and scattered throughout the nations. On the other hand, you may be one who is led away to death, but mark it well. It's all in God's hands because God's got everything under control. And by the way, that's very comforting to know, is it not? God's got the final say. The devil's doing his thing, but God's got him on a short lease. He is, after all, God's servant. And when he appeared before God, in the book of Job, God asked him a lot of questions because he appeared there before God because he's God's servant and God was using him, yes. And some of you are going to say, how in the world can you say the 13th chapter of Revelation and this mayhem and killing could be used, could be used by God? The devil is just, it just seems like he's just rampant. He's on a rage and he's doing what he wants him to do. No, he's actually doing what God wants him to do because... This is a day of Jacob's trouble. These trials, these horrendous persecutions are designed for good of God's people. He's going to save one out of every three Jews to come back to the land. That's got to be one of the biggest revivals the world will ever see. And he does it through purifying them. Satan doesn't know it, but God's using him to bring his people back to himself. Listen to this. Now we see another beast, as if one wasn't bad enough. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. John says, look it, I saw one coming out of the ocean. Seven heads, ten horns, the world empires, figured in one animal. But then I saw, as I looked over the land, turned my head, island of Patmos, I saw another beast coming out of the land. Could this be a Jewish false prophet that Jesus spoke about, the ultimate false prophet? Listen to his description. Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke like a dragon. Huh. What did Jesus say about false prophets? Wolves in sheep's clothing, you'll know them by their fruits. You can't tell by looking on the outside, they look as harmless as a doubt, but they are despicable and evil and harmful. You'll know them by their fruits. Here we see a lamb with two horns, but he speaks like a dragon because he also is a demon-possessed individual. He is the cohort. He is the partner in crime. He is the false prophet of the Antichrist himself. The Lord Jesus had a prophet that went before him John the Baptist. And he pointed out Jesus as the Lamb of God. Now we see another prophet, but this one's the ultimate false prophet. No credentials, like John had credentials. This one has none. And he's there to point to the beast, to command and, in fact, enforce that the world worships him. Listen to this. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke like a dragon, and he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he performs great signs, so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of men of the base. Let me stop right there. One of Israel's worst times in history was Ahab and Jezebel reigned Israel. They led the Jewish people into gross idolatry. 
the worship of Baal. God rose up a prophet by the name of Elijah, and a great test was performed. Who is God? Okay, Baal prophets, see if you can call fire down from heaven, because my God can do it. And Elijah got up and he prayed, and fire fell from heaven, and the people said, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. And that one prophet, through that one miracle, restored the nation Israel back to Jehovah God. One prophet, one miracle. Now we see the mimicking of Elijah. In the middle of the tribulation period, and what he's saying to the people is, you guys got your Bibles, huh? your Alcatraz edition? Turn back to the book of Ezekiel and uh, the kings and see that the prophet Elijah called fire down from heaven as an absolute proof that he was God's man. I'm doing the same thing. I'm going to call fire down from heaven in your presence and you will know that I am truly a man of God, because how could, how could anybody do such a miracle unless God was with him? And my command to you is very simple, worship the beast. And so the people of Israel are given this kind of an option. They're going to see this very convincing miracle, but the problem is this. When Elijah called fire down from heaven, he called the people back to worship the God of Israel, who dwelt in the temple of Israel, the invisible God. This man calls fire down from heaven as a proof that he's a prophet of God. He commands the people to worship a idol, an idol, the very opposite. And the display of power will be very compelling, but very misleading. But to anybody, particularly the nation of Israel, they will know it cannot be true, it cannot be true. God's man would never command us to worship an idol. Listen to this, and I'm reading. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an idol, an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. And he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast might both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Here we see an idol set up in God's holy temple that not only speaks, which isn't a big deal in this age of electronics, but he breathes also. That's a big deal. Now I can imagine the one percenters sitting in their foxholes, <laughs> maybe you'll call them rabbit holes in New Zealand, looking at their large screen TVs that cover the entire wall, and they see the idol being set up in the city of Jerusalem in the temple that's talking, they're going to start congratulating themselves and say, look at that, that's our technology. They got all that from Silicon Valley, a talking idol, and an idol that not only talks, he's artificial intelligence, brother. He even commands those that won't worship him, he even commands, he puts them to death. He has that power. And listen, he also breathes. This isn't any ordinary talking machine we're talking about here, folks. This is deception upon deception to the max. The world is going to buy this lie, hook, line, and sinker. The Bible calls this the mother of all lies. And what is the mother of all lies? That this man sitting in the temple is God in the flesh. And that we are supposed to, the world's inhabitants, bow down and worship this despicable idol. That's the mother of all lies. Most of the world will buy into it. They've already sold down the river, so to speak, God's word, God's people, and they're open. If you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. The world is going to fall for this huge, huge delusion. Wow. You know what? <clears throat> I'm going to cover a little bit more on that next broadcast, but because I can't cover all this stuff in one message, that's for sure. But this is unbelievable. Maybe let me close on a high note. <laughs> 
I uh, visited a friend in the hospital just a couple days ago, and unfortunately he's not going to make it. He's dying. And uh, dear brother, I've known him for many, many years. And uh, I just shared a couple things with him, and I'll, I'll share them with you. Hopefully you're not dying, although we all are. We just don't know when, right? But uh, we're going through a lot of problems. All of us are. Man is destined for difficulties and problems, just like the sparks fly upward. So when I speak to you, I, I know I'm speaking to someone that needs to hear God's word. And I shared with this man three verses. First one I shared with him was this. The afflictions of the righteous are many. I said, John, this man's name is John, John Berry. I said, John, listen, brother, I got a message from you right from the Lord. Here it is. It's in the Psalms. It was King David that said it. The afflictions of the righteous are many, but the Lord delivers them from them all. I said, John, God has all your lifetime delivered you from afflictions, and he's going to deliver you from this one too. Now, you may be passing into the presence of God tomorrow. We don't know, but that is the ultimate deliverance. God is going to deliver you. Then I said, here's another great verse for you. I've been studying the book of Revelation, and I discovered that <clears throat> during the tribulation period, when the Jewish remnant is going through the worst time in all of their history, even worse than the Holocaust, that God gave them great encouragement, the ones that believed in the Messiah. And what he said to them was, they overcame him, the believers overcame the devil and the Antichrist by the blood of the Lamb. I said, John, you've been redeemed for many years. The day that you put your faith in Jesus, all of your sins were washed away. You are as clean and white as snow in God's sight. And then when you leave this earth, you're going to go directly into his presence. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. And boy, you know what he did? He just, he couldn't talk. He had something in his throat there. Couldn't talk. He just smiled at me, a big smile on his face. He went like this. Anticipating going to heaven. How about it, my friend? You're looking forward to... Where are you going to spend eternity? We are just pilgrims passing through. That's all. We're just passing through. Just staying here for a little while. This world is not our home. <laughs> We're going to be crossing the Jordan River soon. Jesus could come at any time to get us. The afflictions of the righteous are many, but the Lord delivers them from them all. Thank you for joining us today, and may the Lord bless you. Until next time. <laughs>